Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space. You are tuned into Long Exposure Photography Between Concept and Technique, hosted by Sony. And for that, we welcome to the virtual floor, Sony Artist of Imagery, Thibaut Roland. Thibaut, how's it going? Great. How are you doing? Good. Long time no see. How's everything yeah. been? Oh, it's been great. I'm really excited to talk about Long Exposure today. Good. Well, we're excited to have you. Of course, I will remind everybody, if you do have any questions, feel free to get those in either during the presentation or once Tebow wraps up and we do a little Q&A round. But I'm going to turn it over to you, Tebow, and I'll see you in a little bit. All right. Sounds good. Let me start sharing my screen. There we go. It should be coming up pretty soon, if not already. So... I would like to start by thanking you all for being here today. And I want to thank BNH for hosting this lecture, in particular, Derek. Um, like I said, I'm really, really excited to talk about probably what's my number one favorite technique, um, long exposure. And I will start by sharing some of the concepts of the technique. And then I will go into the meat of um, the technique itself, what equipment we'll be using, um, what equipment I would recommend and so on and so forth. So let's get started. So just to tell you a little bit more, more about myself, I'm originally from France. I'm currently based in Portland, Oregon. Um, I am one of the Sony artisans of imagery and I would define myself as being a fine art photographer specializing in seascapes, architecture and landscape photography. As you will very soon realize about 95% of what uh, of the images you'll see are in black and white. And 99% of the uh, work that I do has some kind of long exposure um, flavor to it. So let's introduce what long exposure is. If you ask most people, they will agree to this following uh, definition, which is that in photography, long exposure corresponds to the use of a very slow shutter speed to capture images on a digital or substrate uh, or physical substrate, meaning that you can use a very uh, long exposure, very slow shutter speed, no matter whether you're shooting in digital or film or paper negatives or anything like that. But for the sake of this particular presentation, I'm actually going to focus on digital photography. So here's an example um, in this slide and the next few slides of that tree that I am basically capturing with different exposure times. This one is 200 or 250th of a second, so one over 250. And you can consider, think of it basically just as if you were shooting it handheld here. Very fast shutter speed, and just as expected, as you're very familiar with um, shooting handheld, everything looks super sharp in your picture. Now, what I'm gonna be doing in the next few slides, starting with this one, is that I am going to artificially um, slow down using a trick that I will tell you in a few more slides. I will slow down this exposure time and you will see what effects um, will actually be uh, seen on that tree. So this is a quarter of a second. At a quarter of a second, pretty much you will see exactly the same thing as if you were um, shooting handheld with a hundredth or two hundredth of a second. Everything is still super crazy sharp. Now, this particular picture shows the effect at four seconds. Four seconds, you can see how on the right-hand side of the tree, um, the leaves are starting to get blurred out. And the reason why they're getting blurred out is because during those four seconds, the wind has had enough time to shake those leaves. And uh, as a consequence, because they're moving, they end up being blurred out. If I am zooming into the foreground, you will see that it is actually exactly the same thing happening um, with the weeds in the foreground. As a reference on the left-hand side, I am just showing you the previous picture that I 
um, shared before that is also that is a quarter of a second and you can see how much of a difference it makes to go from quarter of a second to four seconds things start to get blurred out um, at longer exposure times so let's keep increasing this exposure time in this case for that particular picture it is two minutes long so this is some very very long exposure especially when you're shooting in the daytime but what's really cool when you look at this picture is that the clouds also start to show some really nice streaks because those clouds during those two minutes it's been enough time for them to actually also uh, travel a certain distance therefore they also get blurred out which still is going to happen with the leaves in the tree because again of the wind moving those um, those leaves. And let's just keep increasing the exposure time a little bit further. This is four minute long exposure. And you can see how now those clouds are making these really, really soft, very nice streaks that are very typical of a super long exposure. Um, and this is really why I love this technique because you can use exposure time to start modifying what you're seeing. But I'll get back to that in the next few slides. So here are, um, in the next few slides, a few additional uh, examples. In the case of this particular slide, you can see how the wind turbine on the left-hand side looks completely sharp. And that's because we shot it with a pretty fast exposure time which in this case is around 1 60th of a second. On the right-hand side, now I have an exposure time of half a second. And half a second now will be enough of an exposure time that you will see the movement of the blades of that wind turbine. And you will be able to introduce this element of movement in your uh, images, in your work. Another example um, that was also shot in the Palouse in Eastern Washington, on the left-hand side, you still see that quote-unquote handheld uh, picture, how it looks. And you can see how every single uh, blade of the, the wheat here um, is extremely sharp. And because it's so sharp, there are so many details here in the foreground, that it's kind of taking away really from um, the main subject in the picture, which is these um, silos and, and grain elevator. On the right-hand side, now I'm using several minute long exposure, and you can see how the foreground is really blurred out very nicely. It's still there. You can still see some really nice patterns, patterns and textures, uh, but it's not there to the point that it's completely overpowering um, your main subject in the picture. And as a side note, you can also see how these clouds now are creating these really, really cool streaks in the sky. So why would you want to use this technique of long exposure? Um, even though I already told you um, a couple of reasons, there may be more than that. So, Here's an example on the top left hand corner. Again, consider it as handheld captured. Uh, this is a picture in a very, very touristic place. There's a lot of people just walking around, enjoying their time, taking selfies, and so on and so forth. Um, as a photographer, it may not be something that I will want to include all these people here um, in this scene. So if I'm, if I'm using an exposure time that is going to be very, very long, the great thing about it is what you can see in the bottom right-hand corner picture where most of the people are, have completely disappeared. You can sort of see still a little bit um, their quote-unquote ghosts, their silhouettes. But the idea is that if I was to expose for an even longer exposure time, uh, 
um, people would completely disappear and I would not even be able to see them at all. So that would be a pretty cool thing to do in um, situations where there are so many people around. The other really cool thing that I do love about long exposure is how it will remove distracting elements. So these are two images of a sculpture in the southwest of France. Um, don't ask me exactly why they decided to make a sculpture of the uh, skeleton of a snake. I just know that this is really cool and something that I had wanted to shoot for a very long time. Um, it's, as you can see, out in the water. And because it's you know the ocean, there are waves. And you can see all these little wavelets, all these details um, in the water on the left-hand side picture, which is a regular exposure. And all these little wavelets are really taking away, uh, they're being very distracting when it comes to actually focusing on the main subject in your image, which really is that sculpture of the snake. Um, on the right-hand side, I have a four minute long exposure. And now you can see how I have basically entirely removed all these wavelets. Now the water is super silky smooth. Um, and I have also done essentially the same when it comes to the clouds. The clouds are making these really cool streaks too. And if I keep pushing this, this idea even further, I can really use those super crazy long exposure times to now create this image that is um, by definition, the most minimalistic that um, you can think of, where in this case, for instance, you have just this one um, really set of poles and, and you know pieces of wood in the water, but everything else is essentially removed. So yeah, it's you know a really good technique to basically create negative space and uh, go full force into minimalism. Here are a couple other examples um, of images that really are using this um, idea of pushing things quite a bit to the minimalistic um, aspect of things. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is that now you can even use the elements. And by elements, what I mean really is um, using the clouds to your own advantage uh, to create an additional level of composition. And what I mean by that is that on the left-hand side, you can see how you have this really kind of cool um, cloud um, action going on in the sky but it's not really helping um, read your image better in that case. Um, it is a cool texture, but it doesn't necessarily bring much more to the image than that. On the right-hand side, however, using um, a little over three minutes in this case, I was able to introduce the movement of the clouds inside my image and I, that ended up creating those streaks that I have been mentioning since almost the beginning of the presentation. And those streaks turn out that they're actually pointing straight at, you know, what I want the viewer of this picture to look at. So this is really a great way to help you um, strengthen basically your images into something that's going to be stronger and easier for your viewership to um, look at and understand what's going on in your picture. Now, if I take all these different aspects, um, this slide is really all about how you can go from the left image here, where you can see all the people just going about their business, you know, the clouds in the sky that are not necessarily bringing much anything interesting to your image. And with the long exposure, turn it into something much more interesting where you see the fountain um, over there in the middle of the image is turning into this really silky 
very smooth objects that kind of attracts the attention of the viewer as well. And you can also, again, remember what I said about the clouds, you can use those clouds to uh, create a better composition. And what I mean by that is that I use the clouds to essentially frame what's going to become my main subject, subject in the picture. You can frame it and by framing it, you are making, again, this image much easier to read. And eventually, what I decided to do was to convert it to black and white, enhance a little bit some of those contrasts. And um, really, basically, I created this image that um, was that is now very different from what I was actually seeing in the field. I constructed this image in my mind, and now I used all these different tricks and techniques to um, really change the world and in a way to step away from reality from what I'm seeing and creating something completely different. So this is an ex a slide that um, I recommend people take um, snapshots of. Um, it will come back a little bit later, a little bit more complete. But if you want to start taking a snapshot here, just feel free to do that. Um, and this particular slide, the reason why it's so important is because um, the basically on the left hand side, the left hand corner, um, the left hand column, I'm sorry, will basically tell you for a set of different objects that you have in your image that may or may not be moving. What will be the effect uh, to be anticipated when you're shooting at the different time scales, different shutter exposure times um, that you have in the very first line here? So if we're taking the first line, for instance, an immobile object, well, because it's not moving, it really doesn't matter how long I'm shooting for. It will always be sharp as long as my setup is set in a way that it's not going to be moving. Everything's going to stay sharp there. Now, if I have people moving uh, below a second, there will be really minimal to no changes in how they will show in the final image. Now, if people are still moving around, walking around, but I'm using something more of the order of 15 seconds to 30 seconds, um, people will show as blurred figures, those, those kind of almost ghosts. But uh, the ghosts really are these very, very faint silhouettes that you will see more around one to two minutes. Um, and as long as people are moving, more than two minutes, essentially, you can think of them as becoming completely invisible um, in your final image. I'm not going to go over all these different, um, you know, types of subjects that you have in the image, but this is really the way to kind of read that particular table. So you can see already how, um, depending on the subject that you're shooting and depending on what is going to be moving versus what's not going to be moving. And even more than that, how fast those different elements will be moving. There may be, for instance, clouds that will be moving very fast if they're very close to the ground, or they're going to be appearing to be moving very, very slow if they're super high up in the sky. And so depending on what effect you'll want to get, whether you want only the clouds down, um, like close to you, further down um, to be blurred out, you may, for instance, just use a minute or two minute long exposure. While this is not going to be quite enough to really see those soft streaks for the really, really high up clouds. So at the end of the day, really a long exposure image is really going to be the product of your intent as well as, and now this is a more complete definition for what a long exposure in my opinion is. And it is both 
the use of a very slow shutter speed as well as your personal intent. What do you want to blur out versus what do you want to keep sharp? So just to make sure that we're kind of all on the same page, I know there might be people from um, very different um, you know, levels of expertise. Let me talk a little bit about what a stop of light is. And the very simple definition of what a stop of light is um, corresponds to doubling or dividing by two, so multiplying by two or dividing by two, the amount of light that is going to be captured by your camera. And there's really three ways to do that. This is your exposure triangle. I'm sure some of you guys are very familiar with this. Um, you have essentially three handles. You can play, you can change the aperture of the lens. You can change the sensitivity, uh, quote unquote, which really is the ISO number of your camera, or you can play with um, the shutter speed. And that shutter speed is essentially all that I'm going to be focusing on uh, pretty much throughout this entire presentation. So let's take a quick look at a scale. Um, this is a scale that is showing you different exposure times and every single time, every single number, I'm essentially multiplying by two the previous number to get to that new you know, number to the right-hand side. So just, um, and there's not really any specific reason, but I decided to, to start at one over 250 uh, of a second. If I multiply that by two, it's gonna be one 125th of a second then one sixtieth of a second and so on and so forth, right? So the number of stops is going to correspond to the number of times you are going to be multiplying by two this exposure time. So one stop here would be to go from two fiftieth of a second to one twenty-fifth of a second. That's one stop, I'm multiplying by two. Another stop would be going from one to twenty-fifth multiplying it by two, going to one sixtieth, that's two stops and so on and so forth. And I can just keep going this way any number of times. Um, what I'm showing you here are just the number of stops when your initial exposure was just by chance, uh, two fiftieth of a second, it would take six stops to go to a quarter of a second, 10 stops to go to four seconds, 13 stops to go to 30 seconds, and 16 stops to go to four minutes. Which means that if you have what is called a neutral density filter, which really will be acting exactly just like your sunglasses, it will cut out part of the light that will be quote unquote seen um, that will be captured by your camera. And if this filter corresponds to these number of stops, it means that now you will be able to get to any of these times if you're using the appropriate filter to do that. So if I go back to the table that I had shown you before, now what I did was to add this last line that basically shows you how many stops roughly you will need to get to these different exposure times during the daytime. And this is only true for the daytime. So what I'm saying here, essentially what this table is showing you is how you basically will need, if you want to be able to get to every single one of those different time scales, exposure times, you will need to use multiple filters to obtain all these different effects. Um, now I know it's not necessarily a perfect world. All these filters cost a lot of money. So I will get back to uh, in a few slides to if there's only one filter to get, I will tell you which one it is.
actually, let me do that now. Um, the one that I recommend is a 13 stops filter. The 13 stops filter will allow you to get to those really, really slow exposure times by now playing, compensating with your other um, parameter, the, your other settings in the camera. So the ISO or the, uh, your aperture. If you're closing your aperture, you will be able to get to these really, really, really slow exposure times. If you're opening your aperture, now, <clears throat> excuse me, you will be able to um, shoot for faster exposure times. So really if there's just one filter that I recommend to figure out if long exposure is really your thing without having to pay too much uh, money for all these different filters, the 13 stops is really the way to go in my opinion for daytime. So that now brings me to talking a little bit about equipment. Um, and first of all, let me show you essentially my typical um, you know, backpack or, or what's in my backpack typically. So it's going to be a slightly different depending on exactly what um, subject I'm gonna be shooting, whether it's going to be a tree um, or if it's going to be a pier that's gonna be very close to me, I will be using a wide angle lens and so on and so forth. But what I want to point out in this particular slide is everything that's in green here. Everything that's in green is essentially going to be absolutely mandatory for you to be able to take long exposures in a way that's going to maximize your chances to get a properly exposed image and an image that doesn't have issues such as shaking because you're not using a tripod or something like that. So, Actually, before I keep going on, um, the one thing also that I wanted to mention here is that as you can see, uh, long exposure essentially requires a lot of equipment. And so it is very much a commitment um, on the part of the photographer because you will need a tripod, you will need filters, you will need um, different things that I will go into more details later. And you also have to carry this around when you're actually going in the field to do some shooting. So let's talk a little bit more about the different pieces of equipment. And if you give me a second, I will just take a quick drink. Great, all right. So um, the very first thing that you wanna think about is what camera you're gonna be using. Pretty much any camera these days will have what's called the bulb mode. The bulb mode is this setting that essentially allows you to start and stop your um, capture at any time that you decide it. There are different settings that can also be used for long exposure, like the T setting and so on and so forth. Not gonna go into these details, but at the very bare minimum, you will need an exp the, the bulb setting, the bulb mode that will allow you, like I said, to start and stop the exposure anytime you want, but also go beyond those 30 seconds. Um, what I do recommend is to be using a, an inter interchangeable lens camera. It can be a DSLR, it can be a mirrorless camera. Um, it could potentially even be a twin lens reflex camera if you're shooting film. I mean, it really doesn't matter at that point. Um, what matters, my recommendation, is that the larger the sensor, the better you'll be off because um, of something that I will go into more details at the end of this presentation. But for now, let's talk about um, another very, very important piece of gear that you will need, which is a very sturdy tripod. Um, one of the main 
mistakes that people who come on workshops with me or go to workshops um, at store events with me is that they will grab a very small flimsy tripod and think, oh, I have a tripod, I'm good to go. Or the other thing they will do is that they will use the center column, uh, bring it up, um, and they will be thinking, well, I have the extra reach and I'm going to be fine. The other thing they will do is that they might actually tilt the camera to the side um, and the camera will be offset to the point where the center of gravity will not be basically right where the tripod is. Any of those three factors will promote vibrations for your um, setup. Vibrations are basically your worst enemies when it comes to long exposure because everything will look blurred out, including stuff that should not be blurred out because it's not moving, like buildings, for instance. So there are tricks to avoid having those issues. One, like I said, is a very sturdy tripod. The other thing is going to be avoiding the center column, using the center column. And the third thing will be to use an L bracket. The next thing, which is also extremely important, uh, pretty much the only thing that without, you will not be able to do any uh, long exposure shot whatsoever, at least not in the 30 seconds to minutes range. And um, that piece of equipment is a filter. So it's a neutral density filter. A lot of people um, will use variable filters. So variable filters are essentially two polarizers that rotate with respect to, an to one another. <clears throat> When you're shooting uh, not so long exposures, they may be okay, but you have to keep in mind that if they're um, set to their darkest setting, they will create something like this, which is a cross-like pattern that will happen in certain light conditions and will essentially uh, be overlaying the picture you want it to shoot. If this happens, there's really no way that you will be able to fix this in post. And this is 100% because you're, you would be using variable filters. So rather than using variable filters, I very, very, very strongly recommend, I can't stress that enough, very strongly recommend using plain or graduated filters. Either one work. Graduated filters may become very useful when you're shooting in conditions um, where you have something very bright in one part of your image and the rest of your image is much darker. So typically that would be for sunsets or sunrises. Um, you may want to use graduated filters or reverse grads, but um, plain filters is really, for me, the way to go um, because the dynamic range of the cameras that we have nowadays is so good that except for these extreme conditions of sunset and sunrise, pretty much myself, I never use a graduated filter. I always use a plain one. It's much easier to, to use. Uh, you don't have to fidget with it. You don't have to bring in the field, the extra piece of equipment. Um, so it's much better in my opinion. The plain filters, they also come into two different flavors. Um, these two here on the left side in the middle, those are either square filters or rectangular filters, but they also will come in uh, a version that's called a screw in filter where you will literally screw in the, that filter um, at the front of your lens. Um, both of these options are fine. Optically, they're exactly equivalent. The only thing to keep in mind is for screw in filters. Uh, if you're stacking the filters, meaning if you're putting one filter on top of another, 
or if you're shooting with a very wide angle lens, and it could be a combination of those two things, stacking and the wide angle lens, you may end up seeing the rim of the filters um, in your image. And in most situations, the on, there's really not a simple way to fix this, um, except for to crop your image. So because of this, my recommendation is to use square filters, although it does come at the detriment of how easy um, and, and fast um, they can be used. Now, to make things even more complicated, each one of those different types of filters will come in different um, opacity values. So again, if you consider those as being essentially your camera sunglasses, uh, the sunglasses can be very opaque, very, very, very dark, or they can be much less dark, right? And those numbers literally correspond to the numbers that I had in the uh, table earlier in the previous slide. And so the smaller the number, the less opaque, the less strong um, those filters are going to be. These filters here, the 13, 16 stops, will be the ones, or at least if you combine, because you can stack, as I mentioned earlier, you can stack and combine those different filters to get to these numbers. If the filters you're using are good quality, and it may or may not be the case, there's a lot of different brands out there. Um, and here's a list of the brands that I do recommend. Um, but some of those filters, if they're not good quality, they may end up creating a color cast on your image. And that color cast can become so strong um, that it will be very, very hard for you to fix it any other way than to basically convert your color image into a black and white picture. It's not the reason why I'm, you know, um, so much in love with black and white and converting my images from color to black and white myself. But this is something that you need to keep in mind. Sometimes some of these filters will create this either typically orange for some brands or um, more like bluish um, color casts for other brands. The other piece of equipment, the last few pieces of equipment that you will need is basically going to be, uh, are going to be some kind of shutter trigger. It can be remote, it can be wired, it can be on your phone, it can be an intervalometer. Um, at that point, it really doesn't matter as long as it does the trick. And as long as if you're using it wired, you're not pulling on the wire, or you're not leaving the wire to just dangle in the wind because these can create vibrations as well. And um, those vibrations will end up giving you a blurred out image. And the last thing to keep in mind that I'm actually going to talk a little bit more in details in the next few slides is that you may end up having light leaks depending on your particular setup and what light leaks are. Um, correspond to lights that may come from, for instance, the side of the lens or in between the filter and the holder of the filter. There may be very, very little light that will actually seep in um, inside the lens or inside the camera. But because you were shooting with so little light, such long exposures, that very little amount of light can now create diffraction patterns that may be uh, causing issues. So I'll show you in the next couple of slides how to fix this potentially. So let's talk a little bit about workflow. Um, this is by no means not the only workflow um, that we, you will find out there. This is the workflow that really works well for me. And I'm really looking at this workflow almost as a checklist, you know, like a, uh, a pilot, uh, a plane pilot that uh, makes sure that there's nothing wrong with the plane. They have these checklists to go through. 
and uh, it's just increasing the chances that you will end up having um, a good image in that case. So the very first thing to do, and you can actually even do that right at home, you don't have to do this in the field, is to set up your camera the essentially quote unquote right way. So what you wanna do is to shoot in raw. Um, I would say this is probably the case no matter what uh, technique or what subject that you're gonna be shooting, but this is especially true for long exposure because long exposure may be very prone to uh, having dynamic range issues if you're not very careful um, about it. The other thing that I have a lot of questions about coming from, um, you know, workshop participants or, or during these talks is long exposure noise reduction. Should it be turned on or should it be turned off? My answer really is, um, one, it depends on where are you shooting and what conditions you're shooting in? So if you're shooting in a very, very hot environment, um, that will be more prone to creating noise in your camera. So in that case, I would say yes, uh, definitely use the, the noise reduction feature um, to shoot in these conditions. If you're shooting with a high ISO, yes, you will want to use this. If you're shooting with a small sensor, yes, you will want to use it. If you're not shooting in any of these conditions, then you don't necessarily need to have it. And what really that setting does is that after taking the picture, after capturing the picture that you wanted, it's going to capture another picture but essentially a black picture where it's shutting off, um, you know, the um, aperture entirely or the, the shutter uh, entirely. It's just um, accumulating the noise in your um, sensor. And it will do so for exactly the same amount of time that you shot your initial picture at, meaning that if your initial picture was your quote unquote long exposure picture, was four minutes long, then it will take another four minutes long and you will essentially have to wait until the camera is done processing for an extra, <clears throat> excuse me, for an extra four minutes before you can take another picture. So unless you have to use it, I would say don't bother using it at all. Um, stabilization, some cameras will require you to turn um, in camera stabilization or in-lens stabilization off. Um, but some other cameras, as soon as you switch to the bulb mode, it will actually by default be switched off. So you wouldn't have to worry about that. Manual mode uh, and or, you know, autofocus um, is also a really big one. Uh, my recommendation is to, essentially use your camera as much in manual mode, whether it's for autofocus or if it's for, um, you know, um, ISO level or anything like that, as much as you can, because this way you will really be able to perfectly control what the camera is doing. The camera will not be changing the ISO on you, for instance, as soon as you're putting the uh, filter on, Otherwise it will completely mess your exposure um, and the picture that you will be capturing. So my recommendation is to set everything up in manual, even before you're putting on the filter because that will really help you um, not forget something um, in the next few steps. The next uh, thing is of course, we're dealing with photography here. So uh, you're gonna want to compose your image um, just the same way as you would compose it handheld. But then at that point, you will set up your tripod. After your tripod is set, um, at that point, my recommendation, if your camera doesn't do it on its own, is to turn off the steady state, the, the steady um, shots, the, um, in camera or in lens stabilization and uh, to turn off from AF to manual focus. What you'll wanna do is take a first 
picture without the filter. So essentially it will be the same as if you were shooting the picture handheld. And what you wanna do at that point is get a picture that is first in focus, <laughs> that's better. And two, um, that is showing a properly exposed image. And what I recommend very strongly that you use to determine this is to look at the histogram. The histogram shows you on the left-hand side um, how much of the dark values, how much shadows you have in your picture. And on the right-hand side, it basically corresponds to the highlights. So it will show you if you have too much details in the shadows or if you may be blowing out um, the highlights in that case. You don't, ideally you don't want any of those two things. Personally, I like to shoot a little bit to the right, um, but it's just a personal preference at that point. Then what you wanna do is use one of the apps that are out there, or you will want to use a table. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna have enough time right now to really go over the table. Um, but there are apps um, that exist that will basically allow you to say, okay, here's my initial exposure time. Here's the filter that I have. What is going to be my final exposure time? Or um, what is my initial exposure time? Um, what exposure time do I need, do I want to get to? And then what is going to be the filter that I need to use to get there? At that point is when I would basically start putting the filter on. Um, you can see on the right-hand side here in this image, my filter that I use is square, as I mentioned earlier. And this is where it becomes really tricky because you can have those light leaks that I mentioned earlier. So to avoid those light leaks, on the left-hand side, I'm using a third-party lens because I'm shooting mirrorless, it's very easy for me to use all kinds of lenses, including native that you see on the right-hand side. For native glass, I pretty much do not need to worry about light leaks. However, for third-party lenses, um, if I'm adapting them, for instance, I will have to be careful with those. Of course, when you're putting the filter on or and or um, you know some cloth to avoid like leaks or um, electrical tape or gaffer's tape or whatever you're using. Um, be careful that you're not moving the focus ring. Um, uh, otherwise you will also end up having a picture that's going to be blurred out. At that point, you will want to use the bulb mode, which will allow you to stop and stop the picture at, you know, for however long you wanted to shoot it for. And at the end, when you're done capturing that picture, you will want to double check three different things. One, the focus. So is everything that should be sharp actually sharp, right? Like the things that are uh, not moving should remain sharp. The second one is going to be, is my exposure still correct? So you will want to, again, look at the histogram and make sure that you don't have too much in the shadows or to have anything blown out in the highlights. And the third thing is to look at the picture and see, well, what kind of effect do I have in my picture? Are the clouds in this case, um, you know, for instance, if I wanted them to point at my main subject, this is exactly what I'm seeing here. So I'm happy with that. If the clouds were moving in a different direction, then um, I would not have the effect that I wanted, I might have to take another picture until I basically have that effect that I want. If any of those answers is basically no, focus exposure, long exposure effect, um, is everything good? If the answer is no, then I will take another picture. So here's another slide that I would recommend you also get a snapshot of. Um, this is just a summary of that basically checklist that I showed you um, in the last few slides. All right. So now 
let's go into a few considerations when it comes to this particular technique. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one stop of light is either dividing or multiplying by two a, uh, <clears throat> the initial exposure time that you're starting with. So if your initial exposure time is 2 50th of a second, one stop um, less is going to be one over 500 of a second. One stop more is going to be one over 25 of, the, of a second. Um, overall, for you and me, this doesn't really make much of a difference. If we're looking at what long exposure corresponds to and say, <clears throat> excuse me, you wanted to shoot for four minutes, one um, stop less would be four by divided by two. So that means two minutes. The one most stop, one additional stop would be going from four minutes to eight minutes. So what I am kind of enticing here is that if you have any kind of issues, um, you know, when you estimated how long your exposure should be and you actually have to um, modify that exposure time because you realize that it was not properly exposed, your picture wasn't properly exposed, then it take, it's going to take a lot of time to shoot another picture. So my recommendation is to really be sure, you know, and be very dedicated and very uh, methodical about how you're choosing the filters and the exposure times that you're shooting with, because it can actually be wasting you a lot of time. <clears throat> so just as an indication, typically to take one picture um, it about it takes me about between 20 minutes and an, an hour. So it's very much a dedication. Um, but it's something that I love because it brings me back to the times of uh, film photography in a way. <laughs> um, here's what I mentioned earlier about the sensors. So, and the noise reduction feature. So if you have, a small sensor, typically an APS-C sensor, um, or if you're using a high ISO number, or if you're using a very, very, very long exposure time, or if you are, <coughs> excuse me, shooting in a very high temperature environment, all of these different factors will bring more noise into your picture. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a lot of noise sprinkled all over this particular picture here. To avoid that, this is when you will want to use this noise reduction feature. Um, now you will be able to remove, maybe not, <coughs> excuse me, maybe not the entirety of the noise or, or the hot pixels, but most of it will be gone. So I think that we're kind of getting close to the end of this talk. Um, I'm going to pass on these different uh, images. I just wanted to mention that I do have a few workshops that are going to be um, in the springtime. Um, one that's going to be devoted to infrared photography. Um, it's a, an introductory, basically infrared 101 workshop. Um, in a place where there are really gorgeous um, waterfalls in Oregon. And I also have three other workshops that are going to be more in-depth, focused on um, long exposure, which is everything that I've been talking about today. There will be a lot of hands on um, you know, action and a lot of feedback. Um, and that's going to be in Oregon and in the Palouse, which is Eastern Washington. And if you guys have questions, I would be more than happy to answer. Thanks so much, Tibo. You know we already have the questions rolling in. That was, that's not <sighs> a real question. Um, let's see, where do we begin? <laughs> <laughs> you, you tell me. 
All right. We're going to start. We had we actually had an email question oh. coming from uh, Tayo, who this was emailed in before your your presentation even started, cool. asking when using a neutral density filter number 10 or anything, once you get to that darker range there, how do I see through that filter to compose my image? So what advice do you have for people who are using those really, really dark neutral density filters? Yeah. So when you're using filters that are roughly around 10 or less than 10, usually they're not really a problem <clears throat> for your camera to see through because the dynamic range of your camera is usually more like in the 12 to 15 stops range. So you, you should be able to see something. It may not be very, you know, um, bright, but you should be able to see something. But really my recommendation is to actually take a picture without the filter first, do all your adjustments without the filter first, um, and then don't touch anything that has to do with focus or anything like that. Just make sure that you're very deliberate with your movements and put on the filter on top of the lens, whether it's a screen filter or it's a square filter or whatever you're using. Um, and then you will basically still be focused properly as long as you haven't touched the uh, focus ring or that you did not forget to go from autofocus to manual focus because one trick that, and it still happens to me from time to time, I'm lazy. So I leave the autofocus on from time to time and I forget to turn it off when I have the filter on. But as was mentioned, those filters are so dark that the camera is not able to see through um, some of those really, really dark filters, which means that it's gonna try to focus and at the end of the day won't know where to stop what the real focus actually is so it will just give up and you know will give you essentially a defocused picture so the trick is really you want to take a picture without the filter then put the filter on and at that point you do you do your long exposure Perfect. Okay. So you, you mimicked my advice that I gave him. So I wanted to make sure we were on the same page there. I was like, I don't know if yes, Tebow's going to have a, a better tip, but there okay. you go. Um, we had a couple of people asking about whether you do actually take photos in, in color and, and shoot in raw and then convert to black and white. Do you ever shoot in black and white? So I always shoot in color. My, my cameras um, are all color cameras. Um, they're all Sony mirrorless cameras like the any A1 or A7R5 that you can pick up from BNH, um, they're exactly the same. Um, I do the conversion based of the raw file. So I do not, when I capture pictures, when I'm looking through the viewfinder, I'm actually looking in color because I am now very much used to um, knowing what kind of effect I can get, what kind of com um, conversion I am able to do based on the color picture to black and white, if that makes sense. If it's easier for you to just go from the start, um, you know, and visualize in black and white, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, my recommendation is just always shoot in raw because that will allow you to go back and forth between all, the, all these different options. Okay. And as far as the, um, the characteristics of the ND filters, we had a great question in here um, from Sydney joining us on Zoom asking, are there specific characteristics of one brand of ND filter versus another that would be useful when deciding which ND filter to, to purchase? Yes. Um, and there are characteristics that are not necessarily just um, like how good the filter is. There are characteristics that are also how expensive those, those filters are. Um, so my recommendation is to get the best quality filter for the best, um, for, for the lowest cost, essentially. Um, if you remember, I had a list of different companies that I recommend. Uh, Breakthrough Photography Filter, I really like them because they have great customer service. If you have issues with your filters um, or if they come up with a newer line of filters, you can actually send you your, 
send them your old filter and they will change it out for free. Or at least they used to do that not too long ago. So that's pretty crazy. Um, but they're more expensive than the other ones. Um, Lee are also good filters. Um, the very first uh, filters were not so good. The brand new line is really good. Um, they don't really have any color cast anymore. Um, they're, when it comes to filters, they're pretty well priced. They're around, I think, $150, which is still significant amount of money. Um, the other filters that I do recommend, which are pretty good, are Nisi filters. Um, the only thing with those filters is that they're great for visible light. They are not quite so great for infrared light. Um, I do have a converted camera to infrared. I have tried those filters on and um, I was not able to use them as what they were um, advertised for. So typically if I wanted to use a 16 stops filter on my infrared converted camera, it actually was really just maybe eight stops from the top of my head. So uh, it really wouldn't let me do those extremely, extremely so slow exposure times. And then you have those filters that are much, much cheaper, but much, much cheaper also usually means much worse quality. Um, so if you just want to give it a try and figure out if long exposure is for you or not, the really cheap ones may be something that you would consider, and then you will upgrade to something that uh, you know is better quality, and but will cost you a little bit more money. But if you just want to test it out, you know, fifty bucks um, is just fine. Okay, we have. A, I'm going to sneak two more ND filter questions in. Yes, we have a, one. One asking what your opinion is on magnetic filters. And then well, Keith joining us on Zoom was asking if you use a circular polarizer when shooting with square ND filters and do you use graduated ND filters? Mm -hmm. So um, magnetic filters, I would say I love the concept and um, some manufacturers out there, they will actually allow you to have holders that are larger than the diameter of your lens. This is really what you want um, when it comes to magnetic filters. You don't want to have uh, to be using basically filters that are magnetic uh, with a mount that's going to be the same diameter as your lens because if that lens happens to be a wider angle, um, there's a pretty good chance that you will actually still see the rim of uh, the filter because adding that extra um, holder will basically make that filter protrude further away from the lens. And so that's going to create even more vignetting. But if you're using those really wide um, mounts, then that's totally fine. They're very, very practical, like very easy to use basically. Um, and I apologize, what was the second part of the question? The second part of the question was, let's see, graduated and <clears throat> as well. Oh yeah. So graduated ND filters, um, I very rarely use. Um, I would essentially only use them for basically sunset or sunrise pictures or for any situation where I have essentially one part of my, um, what's going to be in, in my image, going to be extremely bright with respect to the rest of my image. And I still want to have the rest of my image um, properly exposed. So I'm going to be using that graduated filter <clears throat> to dim down basically what's very, very bright and sort of make it uh, a little bit closer in terms of um, luminosity to the rest in, in the picture. Okay, we're going to get one last question here. I do apologize to anybody who didn't have their questions answered, but we have all, all Tebow's information there if you guys wanted to reach out. Um, this is a great question here from Jerry, especially given the fact that you said it can take 20 minutes to an hour for a single exposure. Yes. 
how do you deal with changing light values? For instance, intermittent clouds that are modifying the sunlight or sunrise, sunset when the light is changing quickly. Once you press the shutter, you have yes. no control at that point, right? Exactly. So um, a lot of it is experience. Um, and, you know, you, if you look at me when I'm setting up in the field, you'll see me just with my, my nose up in the air looking at clouds and figuring out how fast those clouds are moving and, and how many of those clouds are um, in the sky to try and get an idea of like how often um, that light condition uh, may change. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of it is, a, is very much guesswork and um, trial and error. Sometimes, sometimes when light conditions change, I have to shorten or lengthen my exposure time as my camera is actually capturing. Um, and just by eye, I'm kind of guesstimating whether it's one stop one way or the other. And sometimes it's a hit, sometimes it's a miss. Um, so my recommendation is that try to figure out kind of in average how it looks and how it's be you know how how that um, light condition change behaves um, but then just try multiple exposures unfortunately there's really not much else to do at that point mm. sometimes um, if it's less of an intermittent change and more a um, gradual change, like for instance, for a sunset, where you know light is just going down and not going to go back up, then what I would do also is go from, say, a 16 stops to a 13 stops, and then to a 10 stops, and then to a 6 stops. So that's another trick. Okay. And then just really, really, really be glad that you're not still shooting film and that you're shooting digital. oh yeah mm -hmm. you didn't spend six hours out there to say oh i didn't get anything yep reciprocity failure there you go well look this was super informative tebow as always a uh, huge thank you to thank you for you. joining us and obviously yeah, so much for hosting and all of our viewers from around the world who are watching and got your your questions in but that's it it is uh dinner time here on the east coast so tebow we're gonna let you go and a huge thank you to Thanks. you again and yeah thank, thank you, you yeah, Thank you ahead. all for being here. And I just wanted to mention one last thing. Um, if you guys are interested in, you know, either seeing more of my work or learning about the next presentations that I'm going to be giving, you are more than welcome to hop on my website and sign up for my newsletter. And uh, you'll know what's going on with me. <laughs> Perfect. There you go. You heard it from the man himself. Go check out the website for more information. Stay tuned to... Uh, what he has going on with the workshops, a lot of exciting stuff. And you will be seeing him right here on the BH event space in the coming months as well. So we'll stay tuned for that. But uh, it is time. We hope you guys got your fill of uh, information on long exposures today. But that's it. Another round of the BH virtual event space is in the books. We'll catch you on next time.